What can I do to help them? And it's not what can they do for me today, and it's not you know all about me. It's come at it with what problems are you dealing with, and how can I help? And if I can, I will. So coming out of law school, did you have sales experience before you went to ADP? So yes, my biggest mentor growing up was Dave Meltzer and David Meltzer had a handful of companies and I learned solution-based selling kind of when I was er you know, earlier in life as an intern for him. So I had some, um, you know, not like a full, like that was my only real job yeah. at, was six months. So I didn't have a ton of track record, but I did realize the power of making friends and it's a business principle I live with today, two of them, making friends and having fun. Yeah. And I realized that if you make friends with people, that's all that matters. People like to buy from friends. Yeah. And they'll buy because you're providing a solution. And if you really understand and dig into their problem and what they need, if you can provide them a solution, they're going to do it because you've built trust. And so I built all my clients that way through trust and leveraging relationship capital. So I felt very confident that I could go back to them and they would come with me. So step back in time, how long ago was this now? 2007, 2008. Okay. So step back in time to that moment for a minute and break down how does one become the number one salesperson for ADP? Because I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a challenge with selling and you went into your first entrepreneurial venture selling with sales experience being the top person in the country for a pretty big company mm -hmm. that was highly competitive and in the same vertical that you were selling, the same product that you were selling. So you really had the odds stacked in your favor for people that aren't, that don't really understand solution selling or, sure. or how they might do that. Could you break that down for them a little bit, how it might help them? Absolutely. So it starts actually even before that. And I have always, luckily my mentor Dave Meltzer stressed early when I was a teenager, relationship capital, relationship capital, relationship capital. And what does that mean? And that means that you build relationships and you make deposits consistently into those relationships. Mm -hmm. So when the time is right and you need something, you can make a withdrawal mm -hmm. and it's not forced, it's not fake, it's real. Mm -hmm. Because you're always providing solutions and value to people. So now explained a little more in detail, what that means is, if I'm, I met you, right? And it's, how can I help? That's the first modality when you meet someone is, what can I do to help them? And it's not, what can they do for me today? And it's not, you know, all about me. It's come at it with, what problems are you dealing with and how can I help? And if I can, I will. Mm -hmm. So if it's volunteering your time, if it's making an introduction, if it's providing a service that you might have access to or know someone who's having an access to. So I did that all through high school and I always had this modality of I'd rather learn than earn in high school so mm -hmm. I was always interning and always surrounding myself with with people that are further ahead and where I want to be mm -hmm. so that way I would have that relationship capital so when I got the job at ADP well I was 24 years old well most business owners are much older than me mm -hmm. so I couldn't walk in with my young face and just say hey you don't know me but I'm selling ADP services so what I did is I reached out to my support group the very first thing I did so I reached out to Dave Meltzer and I said Dave I just got this job at ADP you know a lot of business owners with <laughs> one to 50 employees. Would you do me a favor? Would you make a warm introduction and let them know that you are making that introduction on my behalf mm -hmm. and that you do or don't trust me? Mm -hmm. And then they'll take the meeting. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to a, my entire support group and said, please make those introductions on my behalf. And I had these 300 warm leads that I could then call on and say, hey, Roland, I know Dave Meltzer introduced us. I'm here to sell you payroll services. I'm sure it's not something that you want on your plate today, but mm -hmm. let's get into who are you with today mm -hmm. and are there any pain points? And if there are no pain points, can I just save you some money? And will mm -hmm. you support me? I'm a young in my career, but I promise to work tirelessly for you. Right. And if it doesn't work, I'll help you get back to where you are. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking you to bet on me. And so because I had those warm introductions, I didn't have the barrier that most people walk into when they go in and start selling. Knock and they on cold the office call. door and it's just like, you know, can cold I talk to Cold calling doesn't work. Right. So if I didn't have that relationship capital, because I ran through that pretty quickly, yeah. how did I keep going? Well, from there, I started to say, well, let's think about this. Who are the gatekeepers for payroll services? Accountants, bookkeepers, bankers. Because anyone who has a business has an accountant, mm -hmm. a bookkeeper, or a banker, mm -hmm. or all three. Mm -hmm. So I started making friends with them. I started going to them. What kind of clients would you like, Mr. Bookkeeper? Then I went to back to my relationships and said, do you have a good bookkeeper? Because I know a good bookkeeper. Right. So I started actually selling bookkeeping services and accounting services Even and banking services. Even though you weren't making any money from those things, that no. was the pre-sale. But you make one sale yeah. for a bookkeeper, accountant, or banker, and you all of a sudden they're like, wait, this ADP sales rep is, is bringing me business? Right. Then they open their entire book for you, yeah. and you get another 40 or 50 leads. 
And so I really started to strategically look at how I could move and sell once and get 50 sales mm -hmm. rather than cold calling 500 to get 50 sales. Yes. So yes. it was really just abstractly looking at the process and leveraging relationship capital and making deposits where I could and using my relationships to empower others. So then in turn, it would return back to me. That's awesome. So, and thank you for breaking that down because yeah. I think that's really helpful. So the next thing was eye checks? Eye checks, yep. Was eye checks. So now you've opened the doors on that. It's your first entrepreneurial venture. Yes. What do you do? How's it go? So it was actually me and a buddy, Brian Hansen. So the two of us were sitting in my mom's kitchen and we came up with a name, iChex. Mm -hmm. And we looked at each other because he was actually an outside sales rep at ADP and one of my best friends. And I got him to convince him to, to leave ADP and join and do it with me. And we realized that, well, it's one thing to sell payroll services. It's a whole other thing to actually process mm -hmm. payroll and figure out what you're doing. So we made the decision that he was going to run the operations side and I was going to continue on the sales side. Mm -hmm. And he figured out how to service the clients. And I went out and sold and we grew it really quickly, obviously stealing a lot of our clients back and right. leveraging all the track record that we had built at ADP. And we got approached from private equity, some PE groups, and we ended up taking some PE money in 2008, at the end of 2008, hmm. changed the name to Can of PHR and really started to become more of a technology company and realized that this is when the internet was actually really starting to take some shape into the corporate world. And back then it was a very antiquated system. So people would have paper applications, then you'd have one system for payroll. And then if there was an HR file, it was in a, it was in a file. And if you ch moved or changed your address, nothing was connected mm -hmm. and there was no self-service portals. And there was a few companies that were starting to come up with this SaaS based. So we licensed one, white labeled it, made it our own and mm -hmm. kind of came out with our own HRIS platform where we were able to go upstream and upstream meaning number of employees for customers, right. or for our clients, and then started selling actually an all-in-one, fully integrated HRIS platform, which was unique and disruptive. And so now I had the benefit of going back to my existing customers and upsell them. Right. So that allowed us to grow. And then I also had the ability to go to new customers. And so we ended up growing that, opened multiple offices, scaled it nationwide, and then sold it to a company in Florida in 2000, at the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. So two sets of questions then come to mind. One is, Takeaways on your first entrepreneurial venture there, what would you do different if you were starting there today? So I made a big mistake and my first big mistake was I raised a lot of money when I wasn't knowledgeable and understanding how that all worked. Mm -hmm. So I actually got part of my company stolen from me in the sense that we raised money and we stayed in control, but we then were spending money at a same parallel line that we were bringing it in. So we eventually ran out of money again. Mm -hmm. And the private equity groups were willing to put more in but because we didn't have our piece to contribute, right. we got diluted, diluted, diluted until eventually we lost control and we ended up selling the company at a time when we didn't want to. Right. I jokingly say I got my MBA through the School of Hard Knocks. Yeah, but, as many of us have. <laughs> but you know what? I learned so much. Yeah. Uh, so number one, I would have been a little more thoughtful on the amount of money we were raising and our deployment of those funds and had better controls as to how we were spending. So specifically, just because that's not, and I don't want you to give the actual numbers in your situation, but for people that are listening that are thinking, wait a minute, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean exactly? So it means that not only- What specific things should they be thinking about? Sure, is we ask for a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. Let's do a scenario. Let's say that you're starting a company and you think you need $100,000. Sure, so if I need $100,000, let's map out where that 100,000 is gonna go mm -hmm. and what it's gonna be used for specifically, mm -hmm. we didn't really do that. We earmarked enough that we thought was gonna carry us for about 18 months and we were gonna grow into a point where we didn't need more money. Right, right. Which is a common mistake most entrepreneurs make is we won't need another round. Mm -hmm. You will need another round, whether it's for strategic acquisitions, whether it's for a whole new business model that, that comes up while you're growing. It, it's funny you say this because I literally had a phone call on the way over here to meet you where I was told, and we won't, this is the only round we'll ever need. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, it's not because you can't ever know that. Correct. It might be the only round you need if nothing changed and all of your assumptions now were are valid and you don't want to go past this one point. Right. But you're probably going to need more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, even, it's even, just funny that you said that because I literally just, <laughs> I was like, I just heard that. And, and it was a mistake I made. Yeah. You always think, oh, I'm not going to need more money. Well, you don't know that mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So knowing that you don't know that, you should always raise a little more than you think you need. 